I think that this would be a wonderful time to bring out onto the stage my friends, Jamie Heineman and Adam Savage. Jamie, I love that you came in Wilfred Brimley cosplay today. <laughs> Thank that, you guys for waiting. Um, so listen, I have a little list of questions here that I would like to talk about, and I'm going to get them out of the way as quickly as possible so we can get to what is important to all of you in the room. The very first thing that I would like to discuss is something that has become a Comic-Con tradition, uh, and that is uh, you going incognito yes. at shows. Now, is, a, number, a number of years ago, I was in the green room, and there was a, a, a guy in there, and he was wearing a suit, and he had this really cool, like, slee stack lizard mask, right? And he took it off to take a drink of his water, and holy shit, it was Dominic Moynihan. And I was like, you're jumping in the And he was like, that's why I wear the mask. And he put it <laughs> back on. So I imagine that there are a fair number of people who we all love that walk around Comic-Con in disguises. I once put on a mustache. <laughs> and it worked. But you're the only one I know of who makes it into a treasure hunt. Talk yes. about it a little bit. Well, so I, Jamie... Jamie actually has a method that I really envy when he walks the floor. He puts on a baseball cap and he, he does the Arnold Schwarzenegger trick of never stopping. <laughs> Just walks, walks, walks. And if someone spots him, he goes like this. <laughs> and because he's kind of like your dad, everyone goes, oh, okay. <laughs> but me, I'm more like your brother. So, uh, yeah, my first Comic-Con, I actually made up a Hellboy costume. Uh, and, I, you know, I... I go all out, and this year I went all out, and in fact, it's now starting to play against me. Uh, we can load up the picture of what I was uh, yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> You've so, got the Akbar part right, but I think you missed on Admiral just a little bit. No, no, let me, let me explain, just to make, if it's not geeky enough. Um, that is a, I bought a sculpt of casting of Akbar on eBay about six years ago that I had authenticated from the eBay photos as m it had to be origi from original Lucasfilm molds. And actually Phil Tippett confirmed it for me that it is his original sculpt. I had my friend Frank Ippolito actually turn it into a movie quality mask. And then I thought I could make the tunic. I bought the felt that Admiral Akbar's tunic is made out of, but I also really like uh, naval uniforms because I made myself a master and commander uniform. So I commissioned a replica of Lord Nelson's Admiral's <laughs> uniform. Of course you did. <laughs> it's a trap. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, uh, you now I know that I, I've seen you as a stormtrooper. Yes. Uh, with one small but, but important flaw in the armor. Yes. And that was great. And then you were a yam spirit. I was, year, I was right? yes, I was no face right. uh, from Spirited Away. Right. Perhaps my all-time favorite costume. It was wear. one of mine as well. I remember going into the suite at your hotel room and being terrified by it. It is, uh, it's spooky to stand next to it. Right. Um, and so today, though, I wanted to do, I was thinking I had so much fun in no face and the theater, the, the, the theater that you get on the floor when you're in costume and you're meeting people in costume, it's a real two-way street. And I thought, what can I do to play around with that? So today, this afternoon at 3, we did an Adam Savage flash mob with 75 people dressed as me. <laughs> um, we have it. There it is. <laughs> yeah. You know, I wondered why hat prices spiked in the last two days. <laughs> no, those are all vacuum forms of my cowboy hat. Super accurate. Jamie, are you in there? No. It's, I was thinking that a Jamie might show up, but none did. Yeah. Oh. I know. We're all really sad about that. Talk a little bit about the game. How do you do it? So how do people come up and find you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So normally when I do the, when I do the incognito, when I head out onto the floor, I drop a hint as to what I might be. Uh, and then if people don't find me after a certain period of time, I drop more hints. And then I might just say things like, I'm at booth 2349. Um, yesterday, as Akbar. My only tweet was, I am on the floor. <laughs> About a minute later, someone who I don't think read that tweet, a 10-year-old boy, looked up and saw the costume and said to his parents, 
That costume's so good, it must be Adam Incognito. <laughs> so, clearly next year my costume has to be shitty. Yeah. Thinking of a bargain basement Jack Sparrow. <laughs> um, you guys are nominated for your fifth Emmy Award this year. Yes. That is amazing. You are nearly the Susan Lucci of <laughs> Emmy Awards. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, Antiques Roadshow, I think, is on their 11th or 12th nomination in the same category. Uh, fair enough. Um, uh, what <laughs> One <did> fan. <laughs> <laughs> the Antiques Roadshow guy in the house. Okay. <laughs> Let's give it up for that pawn shop show. Woo! Um, so, I know, I hate it too. So, um, uh, it's great... So I've been nominated for a couple of awards, and until it actually happened, I didn't really understand that when you say it is such an incredible honor to be nominated alongside these people or programs or whatever, it really is like, okay, I guess if, I mean, I, like, if I win, okay, but if I don't, like, I have already been recognized. So you guys have been recognized five times. Do you make the speech? Do you prepare the speech every time? No. Well, you don't because I do. <laughs> because you kind of like, on the one hand, you feel like a schmuck. You're like, oh, well, I guess I'm going to make my amazing awards acceptance speech because I'm so great. Well, but on the other end, you don't want to be like, oh, you're like you're, I feel like you lose no matter what. Well, yeah. So, you know, if you get nominated as an actor, obviously you're the one receiving the award. So you make the speech for Mythbusters. It is a team effort, and our team is invaluable. They are family. Many of them have been with the show for the better part of the decade we've been on the air. And uh, in, in, it's really important to us, the producers of Mythbusters, that we boil down something where everyone really feels like they've been mentioned because we have 25, 28 people in San Francisco that have busted their ass for 10 years. We've got uh, three edit suites in Sydney, Australia at Beyond Productions, plus innumerable people at Discovery, all of whom fight for this show every single day and are just as thrilled about the results we come up with and the weird ways we want to tell the stories as we do. And it is a complete group effort and we really want to make sure. So we do write a speech and we really try and work on it that it would be like, you know, yeah. thank you. <laughs> like get every name out we can. Well, I also wanted to add, I mean, the Emmys are great, but uh, Mythbusters is a little unique as far as the, the shows that are out there. And, you know, we're up for uh, outstanding reality show, but um, you know, uh, we look back over what we've done over the years and, uh, and how we do it. And um, I like to say that the thing that's unique about Mythbusters um, primarily is that it's about science, it's about 50% science and R&D. Uh, you know, we're investigating these things straight up. A lot of the stuff that we've uh, run across over the years has been, um, you know, it's real science. It's not necessarily you know, authoritative science, but, it, but we've discovered things, we've, uh, we've invented a lot of things and done a lot of creative stuff, and that's thanks to the fact that, uh, among other things, our staff is not just a bunch of, uh, of film-related people, but we have, actual, we have a team of researchers. And between Unlike us, a couple of members of our team actually have degrees in science. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so our process is, is not primarily uh, uh, focused on television production. Uh, about half of it is actually focused on the actual content of it. And, you know, when it comes to competing with, you know, uh, I mean, we're in the same category as Antiques Roadshow and things like that. And it's Antiques Roadshow, Undercover Bosses, uh, Diners, Dives, and I can never remember Shark the Shark Tank is Shark a, Tank. Is I, as far as I'm concerned, the category we're in is five different genres of television. Right. You know. So, so who knows? It's a, you know, Emmys are great, but uh, uh, we, we kind of, I think, stand out on our own somehow. And, uh, you know, there's, if there was a category for science documentary or, or something like that, it'd be, uh, we'd probably I, win it. I have, a good, I have a good story about this. We had a, 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 a producer come out from James Cameron's company because we were investigating filming Mythbusters in 3D. Uh -huh. And those guys are the the best at it and they, they came out to spend a couple of days with us on set and after about four or five hours on set Cam uh, Cameron's representative turned to REP and said so let me get this straight the experiment takes precedence over the filming 
And the producer said, well, yeah, I never thought of it that way, but yes, you're right. Let's talk a little bit about what goes into making an episode of Mythbusters, sort of from the conception. Like, this is, this is a myth. This is something that we're interested in. Because your shows, over time, have become less, here's a bunch of cool things to thematically linked things that actually tell a little bit of a story. And with the addition of the build team, like you have, you know, the show has just become, uh, it's more narrative than it, than it was at, at the beginning. And uh, I would love to know, uh, because it's strangely in all the years I've known you, I've never asked you this. How, how, do, you, how do you go about it? So what's, how do you, someone comes up to you and says, hey, I heard blah, blah, blah. Or you look up on the internet, blah, 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 and then you decide what comes next. Well, uh, first, before Adam answers that question, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, uh, uh, as a background, uh, what you don't know and what you can't tell by looking at the television is if we put, um, you know, all of the content, uh, the, the serious content on the television, um, about 90% of it would be on a dry erase board. Uh, that's the way that it works. So once we get our hands on something, uh, however we get there, uh, it's all dry erase board. The funny thing is that the television hates the dry erase board. The Discovery hates the dry erase board. They won't let us do it. And Listen, no... the whole world hates the dry erase board. <laughs> so, uh, I love the dry erase board. Yeah, but that's how we, uh, we, we nut things out and we take a camera phone picture of it and email it around and stuff like that. But, uh, uh, you know, we, we, that's how we plan things. As far as the selection of the story itself, it's, uh, it's based on, we, we have a number of criteria like, um, uh, you know, uh, first and foremost, wh whether we find it interesting, which is great. You know, the, the producers and everybody involved in this is, are like, if you guys are going to have fun with this, if you're, if you're interested about it, it's going to make great TV. So they basically encourage us to, to have fun. And everything else is, is more uh, uh, connecting the dots. We try to, we have to have something that uh, we have our hands on with that we can actually experiment. We uh, weed things out like we don't do, you know, uh, supernatural because. We, we still apologize for pyramid power. Yeah. Sorry. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> by, by definition, those things are not testable. You know, it's like all we can do is pro potentially prove a negative or something like that. So, anyway. Um, it, we end up having the weirdest arguments. Like we, we'll come up with a concept that we like. like we just shot an idiom special, and the, the capper was, I, I don't even remember who thought of it, but we thought, we should test if you can fit 10 pounds of shit in a five pound bag. <laughs> <laughs> and, and production, so, like I said, found right. that we, we, th we found that interesting, right, so right. they let us run so, with it. It, and thank, again, and thank God most of that happened on a whiteboard, I guess. Well, <laughs> first things first. First things first. <laughs> we chose horse poop. It's, okay. It's the most innocuous of the poops. Yeah. yeah. Although I must say, it kind of gets to you after. Oh, a while. It, de it definitely does. But it's, the alternative would have been far worse because you really got used to it. Like, well, everyone stepped into the shop and was like, "Whoa." Did you know that, that uh, camels process liquid so efficiently that camel poop can be set on fire the instant it comes out of the camel? <laughs> really? Did somebody actually try to do that? Yeah, it's it, no. It, it is, this, that this, is this, the next thing we have to do. This, that's on our list. Like, Listen, <laughs> that is great. <laughs> but to, testing that myth led to several really interesting arguments. What's a five-pound bag? What does that mean? So we had like half hour discussion going back and forth on different concepts. Right. Does the bag weigh five pounds? Does, Does the bag it, have it, the capacity to... We chose, it, we chose it to mean a bag that holds exactly five pounds of poop that you could just pop it in and then tie it at the top, right? For you, transport, you, you, I You guess. have to be able to, to, to knot the bag. But then as we were... Obviously, it involved compressing poop. Sure. And when you compress like it... Like a lot of Hollywood. When you... Well, and just like uh, when you compress it, stuff comes out. <laughs> and so we ended up having this argument about like, well, does it matter what you started with? Or if liquid comes out, does the liquid have to go back in? Or is it the poundage? Is it dry poop? And really, like half so it, a day of arguing back and forth. And these are totally important arguments to have because you, got, you know, we're thinking like someone's going to yell at their television and we want to have addressed because we can hear you. We want to address what they might be thinking. 
What was that? He said something about a treadmill. You can't say that. That's like, that's a treadmill is actually Adam's new safe word because he never <laughs> says it. It can't ever happen. Um, uh, I, uh, I recently, I didn't even know that Tested.com existed until about 12 days ago. <laughs> and I think that that's like, if like, and I live on the internet and I didn't know, and I think it is a tragedy that, that, uh, that I and more people don't know about it. Tell, tell the, the, the room here and people uh, at home uh, exactly what Tested.com is and what you uh, hope to accomplish with it. Well, Tested, uh, Jamie and I joined forces with Will Smith and Norman Chan, who've been running Tested for years, uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and when we joined, it was a site in which they were looking at new technology and testing stuff like that. It's, it is sort of what it sounded like. And we have, in the past year, we've been figuring out the shape of it. We've been using it as an incubator of interest, as it were, both for Jamie and I and for Will and Norm. Uh, so we've been doing, you know, we do standard product reviews, like look at the Oculus Rift uh, uh, virtual reality goggles. Uh, I do podcasts from my, uh, from my lair, from my man cave every week. Uh, we do builds. Uh, Jamie does uh, instructionals about welding. I mean, it's like kind of whatever we're interested in talking about. And, you know, it, like I said, it's an incubator for us to figure out what people are interested in. I mean, we just did a piece where I helped Norm assemble his hand solo blaster, if anyone saw that. And... It got a tremendous response, and you never know what As what's tremendous as that response? No, much bigger than that. I think at least four people saw it. <laughs> okay. Well, also, um, you know, as we all know, television and the Internet are kind of in process of merging. It's uh, where one stops and the other starts is, is becoming blurrier all the time. And the thing about uh, we've noticed with what we do on Mythbusters, whatever you see that ends up on television is only a small fraction of what's actually been recorded and uh, and there's a lot of really interesting stuff there so with all of that in mind the uh, the internet is a way of digging deeper into content and we're we're not sure exactly how we're going to do it but but that that would be a, a part of our goal somehow to be able to expand our ability to uh, that, you know, to provide deeper content. Would yeah. you would you be able to? I mean, I don't. This is going to sound like a joke, but it's not. Would you be able to show sort of like the whiteboard process? Because, Absolutely. Because time doesn't matter, and, and it, like, I mean, time does matter, but it also you know you can boil things down into smaller chunks. The the requirements of concision that television in part are you know both make you very much better at storytelling, but there are so many avenues and tangents we have to cut off on the show because we are moving towards a specific narrative point. Yeah, and the, inter the thing is that the interactivity of the internet is, is something that would allow people to choose the level that they wanted to go to because, uh, you know, on, uh, what you see on the television is uh, we have to work so hard to condense what we're doing into practically sound bites. And, uh, and some people, that may be all they want. Others may want to go deeper. And so that's, that's sort of, I, I don't know that we're ever going to, I don't know whether we'll succeed with that or w uh, whether that can be our main focus, but that's sort of what we have in mind with that. Yeah, and it does seem that the response that we've been getting as we look at the numbers that Tested is getting is that when we are really talking about something that's deeply part of our excitement and enthusiasm and the kind of knowledge gathering that we like to do, even in our spare time, those are the things that really resonate, which is great. That is exactly what you want out of a project like that. You know, we're spending our extra hours doing it, and it seems like the, 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 what, what the fans of the viewers of Tested really want is that more deep, intro, uh, introspective stuff that we like. If somebody once said to me, when you're interested, you're interesting. And you can bring that passion to an audience online in a way that I think television doesn't really make possible because there's so many hands in between the idea, the making of the idea, and the delivering of the idea. Yeah, I think that's yes. absolutely right. Uh, absolutely, and you're already seeing, starting to see uh, uh, things like that popping up. I mean, Louis C.K. and his model, and uh, what was it, Arrested Development, that, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, popped up on Netflix. These are things that are starting to move outside of the traditional mode of, of television content delivery. Um, so we, we, we're uh, slowly chipping away at that ourselves and, and, uh, may, and who knows where we'll go. Uh, how many people are in this room are familiar with the name Commander Hadfield? 
For those of you who are not, how, ma <laughs> how, how many of you are familiar with the name Carl Sagan? Okay. There you go. If Carl Sagan had actually ever been able to go into space and live on a space station, that's who Commander Hadfield is. He's a Canadian astronaut, and he spent, uh, uh, yeah, yay Canada, my adopted homeland. Um, they, uh, he spent a great deal of time on the International Space Station, and he did an incredible, tremendous amount of science advocacy and sort of in, made science relevant and interesting to people here on Earth in a way that hasn't really happened maybe since the Apollo program. Yeah, and, Just, and like and that level like, of wow, right? And enthusiasm advocacy. Yeah. You know, yes. one, of, one of the things that we find when we work with guys from NASA is that every single one of them has at least one, if not four, hobbies that are all awesome and yes. all that they explore with every fiber of their being when they're not literally making rockets. Right. And I mean, what Hadfield did in his six months as commander of the ISS was nothing short of remarkable in bringing that enthusiasm and love of being up there and the, the wonder of it and the, the majesty of looking at the planet from up there is incredible. And you guys just got to work with him, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so talk about that. This is not just some tangent about how space is cool. I'm bringing it around. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. It's not my first rodeo. Yeah, that was one of those those rare moments. I mean, we're we're working away in the shop doing our normal thing, and uh, and one of the office staff comes down and says, there, "There's there's a guy named Hadfield, and he's he's on the phone. He wants to talk to you guys." And we're like, uh, uh, "Okay, is it, he's calling from the space station." No, he's calling from space. Yeah, uh, that's what he says. I'm calling from space. <laughs> And we're like, wait, okay. he, he called you from space? Yes. So I picture him talking to Carrie, our, op our office manager, and he goes like this. Yes, I'd like to talk to Adam or Jamie. This is Commander Chris Hadfield. I'm calling from space. <laughs> I totally believe that he did that. I would call people I had never even met just for the to do that. Right, exactly. <laughs> no, listen, I can't hold. I'm in space. <laughs> so can you tell us anything about what you did with him, or is it a yeah, big, no, no, no. big we gigantic to, we, secret? We, we, we shot a couple of different segments with him that we put up on testit.com. Uh, one is which we, we talked about the kind of things they do to handle the boredom of being on the International Space Station. Do they have any games that are specific to zero gravity? Because right? I would Probably be... not a lot of Jenga. No. They do play darts. Now, pointy objects are, for obvious reasons, not allowed. So what they do is they take a, um, they take a weight and they put a parachute on it, like a little cup, so that it slows way down. And then you've got to really guide it towards the target with just perfect linear throw. And it you know, slowly makes its way towards the target. So we so thought like, about that. So it's like air curling. Yes. It is exactly air crawling, yeah. and we thought... Where are my Canadians at? <laughs> so yeah. we thought, what could we do to, to, to give them a game? That yeah, they yeah. Play? Yeah, and so I, I took the idea of the, the darts and things without points, though, and, and uh, combined that with the, the bit about curving a bullet and wanted and wondered if uh, we could actually get them to do that in zero gravity conditions. Because the thing is that... Uh, that things that spin, like a, a golf ball, if you put top spin on it, will will actually go further because it's it's you know it's makes a higher arc, or you can get it to go around things sometimes by putting a spin on it, and uh, even a bullet coming out of a rifle over a long distance because of the spinning, it'll actually walk off to one side of the target. And knowing that, we figured that maybe if you got something spinning really fast. And, and launched it, he could get his dart or whatever to go around something to hit the target on the other side. And so, uh, and, and that meant that we had to go over the list of their inventory, which is quite interesting. <laughs> um, so it's like Apollo 13, except you're making games. Oh, yes. yes, but just like Apollo 13, I'm going to say, like when Jamie was done designing this thing, we had to build a protocol for them to replicate it. Yes. Oh, and, so they go down the list. Yes. It's like, that is so cool. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, is like, you know, crank call people from space on that list? <laughs> I'm looking Put for the, Amanda Huggins. Yeah. <laughs> is that, <laughs> yes, this is Commander Chris Hadfield calling for uh, Mr. Hugh Jass. <laughs> yes, I'll wait. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, this, uh, 
uh, as a lot of things on the show do, it inevitably ended up uh, making this thing out of duct tape. Of course. Um, and, uh, you know. I have, I have a question about that, actually. Why don't you just start there? <laughs> Well, um, you know, we looked at, they, they have quite a lot of materials, but um, it's, it was limited. And, uh, uh, and so we, we went through this process of making uh, little coils of tape to make a larger thing that made a ball with flaps on it and, and uh, a way of, uh, of putting a, 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 a pin, I think, or let's see, we had a, oh, oh they had a paper clip. So paper we, clips, yeah. Yeah, straighten out a paper clip and ran it through the ball hold the paper clip and then blow on the flaps to get it spinning really fast like a turbine and then launch it. And uh, Let's see if we can get it to curve. Yeah. So it's darts with a goalie. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, the, the other thing we did was um, there seems to be a one-to-one -one relationship between great chefs and Mythbuster fans. Like, we keep meeting them. We keep finding that they're aficionados of the show. And among them are uh, two friends of mine, who become friends of mine, uh, David Chang of the Momofuku Group in New York and Tracy Desjardins uh, in San Francisco. So we actually sent David and Tracy to the NASA Food Kitchen in Houston to devise delicious meals with the materials that they had up on the space station. I'm going to go ahead and just say that myth is busted. <laughs> Uh, no, actually, Hadfield, um, Tracy came up with this beautiful uh, burrito where he, she Go used on. beans. <laughs> used beans to actually hold the stuff on the tortilla because you can't make stuff. On, you have to make stuff in zero gravity. Right. And Hadfield really enjoyed it. He called it the Spacey Tracy Burrito. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> uh, how many people in this room have been to one of the magnificent Behind the Myths tour shows? All of you who didn't just make a woo, you got to do this because it's awesome. We are, uh, we are coming to San Diego later on this year. Outstanding. Yeah. It's, uh, it's up on tested.com. You can find uh, where to buy tickets. We're coming to San Diego because we came here uh, a couple of years ago and we had a fantastic time. Um, talk a little bit about the, strat the, the, the strategy of uh, putting together some of those things that you do and then moving to different theaters with different, like, different stage plots and taking it on tour. Like, what are some of the challenges inherent in, in taking a show where you blow stuff up well, and putting ish. it... And, 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 and put it um, I've seen your show, you blow stuff up, <laughs> uh, and, and actually putting it, uh, putting it up on a stage. Well, that actually made us hesitate quite a while before we did this because, you know, we're normally doing big, kind of flashy, spectacular things. I mean, some of the stuff is with bacteria or whatever, but, uh, uh, you know, people, if we show up someplace and we're doing a, a live show and entertainment, that's what is going to be expected. And that's problematic, you know, due to shrapnel and, you know. Well, and if we're actually doing experiments on stage, it's like crickets are chirping and an hour's gone by and nothing's happened because that's most of what experimenting is. Right. Yeah. So in that, that case, shrapnel would probably bring the audience back into it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, um, what we did with that was we uh, we tried to recreate the actual experience uh, of the you know the the at at the core of what we do and uh, and you know a lot of that is when we broke it down a lot of what we are normally doing is we're playing. You know, we're, we're playing like kids play. And so we'll get things and we'll mess around, and, uh, except we're a little bit more th methodical about it than your average child is. Um, not by much. I <laughs> not by much. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, heard, I know you mean me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so we have a series of, of, of things like that where we involve the audience and, and we, we run experiments. And some of them are pretty basic, like, uh, you know, putting people in front of a high-speed camera and making them do a raspberry. It's amazing what you can see. Sometimes. Oh, yeah. No, it's really great to audition a crowd. You're like, all right, we want, well, first of all, we show the clip of Jamie smacking me in the face. In high, One of on my the favorite camera. clips. Then we immediately ask for volunteers. <laughs> and every hand in the theater goes up. <laughs> and then we bring people up. And so, no, then we want to audition people because when you get a, like, a, you get a double raspberry, like, like that on high speed, your lips are doing this, like, see an enemy dance that's insane. Um, so we audition the audience and we get a whole audience to make fart noises while we stare at them. You are living my dream, man. Uh, then guys, I tell them, I give the kids advice, like, not like, not like your grandmother's fart, not like, 
like your dad's for the granddad's are like that. Sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, you guys, in the course of your work on Mythbusters and, and your work prior to Mythbusters, you have used an incredible amount of tools, and you have come to the conclusion that most tools suck. Well, it, <laughs> first of all, we are always using tools for purposes for which they were totally not intended. <laughs> right? for, I will actually ex tell you that in the very first contract we had with Discovery, they had some boilerplate thing about if you are tightening something with a wrench, you are not allowed to put a pipe on that wrench to get more leverage on it. We were like, what? That's like the soul of using a wrench. <laughs> Why did you just tell me I can't breathe while I'm doing it? So we, we, you know, as we we're freelancers and we've been freelancers for all the time before Mythbusters and there's no time that goes by on the show that we don't think what's next, what's next, what's next. And one of the things that we want to branch into is making making some tools. We have very specific ideas about ways in which tools could be better. Yeah, like uh, the first one that we went to, of course, is, uh, you know, if you ever used a sledgehammer, it's, you know, half the time you're missing with it and then it starts to take chunks out of the wooden handle and things like that. So, uh, you know, we have a, hand, or a, a hammer at the shop that we've had forever that we got from some old machine shop that, uh, that we rented at one point and it was laying in the dust. And the guys had just taken a chunk of steel and welded a pipe onto it. So, you know, that thing has been around, we call it the convincer, and we use it all the time. <laughs> it's beautiful, it's a two inch cylinder of steel bolted to some schedule 40 one inch handle, and it's like from the 50s. But the, the basic thing that, you know, we look at uh, tools as, you know, just a way to get where we need to go with something. And uh, there was a, there's, there's, there have been times that, uh, that I've ended up doing things like you know, we, there's a story about, I, at one point I had to, um, I got approached before Mythbusters to do a job with, uh, uh, for a video game company, and they wanted to make this big sword. Oh, Jesus, the and, sword. And it's, you know, <laughs> and they wanted it to, you know, be, it was huge. It was like four feet long or something like that, and it was a forced perspective thing, which got wider as it went out. And they wanted it, I, I found out about it on Friday, and they wanted it by Monday. Sounds so, about right. So I go grab a piece of half-inch plate aluminum and go down to the table saw and cut the bevels, three-inch bevels, on it was, cut a slab, a six-inch wide slab of this thing and ran it off on the table saw. Course, I get upset just thinking about it. <laughs> it. It requires that you actually get up on top of the table saw to <laughs> hold it down. <laughs> and, uh, it's best no. to take off your roller skates. Yeah. Uh, That's but the funny very thing, upsetting to me. Uh, <laughs> well, like a lot of the stuff that we do, though, it's, it, it sounds really scary. I've actually done a lot more dangerous things with that table saw than that. <laughs> The, uh, that's, that's not reassuring. <laughs> well, what, what you do is I, I pulled out a, uh, about a four by six of extruded aluminum square tubing and clamped this piece to that on either end and then held that down on the, uh, against the fence on the table saw and had somebody else raise the blade up through the metal. And so the blade was never exposed at all except for where the tip of it went through the, the aluminum. <laughs> and I would push it through and then stop and then we would unclamp it and move it and do it again. It took me about uh, maybe a half hour to, to cut this lovely blade out that way um, using you know, a table saw. And so we, we do that kind of stuff all the time. And it's, uh, and if you do it, you know, I, that I'm not sure if you're succeeding in making the case that we should design tools. Well, <laughs> <laughs> maybe not. It's like it's Jamie's super fun, happy times table saw extravaganza for kids <laughs> with femoral artery tourniquet <laughs> and burner cell phone with hospitals programmed in. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you in the back of the room, this gentleman here said, take my money! <laughs> so what you're saying is you have a lot of applied practical experience using tools in ways that they were not necessarily intended, and you can take that knowledge and apply it to developing new tools that can be used... And in, in creative and, and unique ways. And also better and simpler tools. I think both of, I mean, both of us love going to hardware stores. We love buying new tools. We love you know, building stuff and making stuff. Jamie describes it, I love this, as taking large chunks of things and making them smaller in precise ways. 
Um, but, you know, like you look at sledgehammers and they all have these in-molded, rubber-molded handles and these designs and all this just shit on them that they don't need. And we love simple, I mean, this, this hammer, we love it because it wears its manufacturing on its sleeve and it makes you smile just to look at it. And a toolbox full of stuff like that is nothing but a pleasure and it means that you are serious. And like, I think we, want to, I think we should bring that out into the world and make a line of products like that. I want to go on a Viking raid right now so hard. <laughs> hey, I bet there's people in this room that have some questions, so why don't you make your way uh, slowly and carefully and not in a non stampede kind of way. I'm just going to tell you that we have, we have about 20 minutes, so I imagine that if you are not in line now, your question won't, you, we won't get to you, so uh, save yourself the sad times. And uh, go right. ahead and tell us, uh, tell us your name and what your question this, is. Sir. This dude up front here, he wins Comic-Con because he was at our autograph signing today. He was also at the Adam Savage Flash Mob, and he's the first person up for questioning. That's nicely done. This gentleman has learned how to tread that thin line between impressive and terrifying. Yes. <laughs> what is your question, sir? Oh, my name's Nathan. Um, I'm just real happy to be up here. It's the first time I've ever asked a question. Um, and I want to say, Adam, the uh, incognito today was very unique. Uh, just never done anything like that, so it was real fun. Um, as far as the question, it's kind of a two-parter here. Um, Pick one part, dude. <laughs> okay, one part, okay. Um, we got a room full of table saws, and you're looking like a piece of <laughs> aluminum right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, doing what you've been doing for 10 years, uh, how do you feel that about being role models for a generation, not just uh, you know people who might have been in there at 15, 20 years old, but possibly even 10 or maybe even five years old. And potentially That's an excellent even... question. You guys are very much role models for everyone from children to adults. I came to the show when I was about 30, and, and, and it has, you, you do that thing where you, you speak to people um, we're kind of regardless of, of their age, and that's really impressive. Uh, how much do you think about that? We, we try to never think of the children. <laughs> it's, you know, Rilke says you must remain ignorant of your best qualities lest you sully them. And we, luckily, what we have is each other, and what that is is it's a constant argument and constant push-pull that I think lends a real integrity to the process. So we try not to think about how are we going to educate the audience or how are we going to stay role models? We're just thinking like, what's the next thing that we want to do that's really cool and that we're interested in what the outcome is going to be? And, you know, that we're still thrilled about what's on the roster. At any given moment, we're like, oh, cool, we get to do that next week. Thank you very much for your question. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Jerry. Um, so, like like uh, Will Wheaton up there, you guys always just been there because my sister and I, my entire family, have been watching you since like kindergarten. So, um, I, so watching you as I grew up, I not only did I age, but not to sound like a, a, a got anything, but you guys aged with us. So. <laughs> so watching you guys age and stuff. Um, do you guys have? <laughs> Do you guys, do, do you guys have any, <laughs> do, do, do you guys have any plans to keep the show going or retiring or passing oh, on no. the torch? We're, we're or... gonna keep making the show until they lock the doors, but let's be clear. What you really mean is that I have aged while Jamie stays the same. <laughs> well, Jamie's clearly reached max level. <laughs> All right, I hope you guys keep going so my children and their children can keep watching. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Heather, and I'm going to ask you a question that my 11-year-old daughter has asked me numerous times. We have seen where you advertise for volunteers, but they have to be 18 years old or older. She would love to be a volunteer, but she's too young. Is there any possibility of having younger volunteers participate in your show? Sometimes. 
Okay. Thank you. I, I mean, you know, when we did the Archimedes uh, death ray for Obama, we, we went to Jamie's wife's school and we used uh, 500 students from Encinal High in uh, Alameda, California. And, and I stole candy from a baby. <laughs> You know, I think, I think I saw a couple of... I think I saw some pictures of people in those baby masks here at Comic-Con this year. Oh, yeah? Those it creepy freaking baby masks. really one of the most terrifying things. <laughs> and Archimedes' death ray for Obama is my Ted Nugent cover band. What is your question, ma'am? Um, hi, my name's Megan, um, and I was just wondering what the inspiration for the show was. Like, did you wake up one day and were like, let's do a TV show, or was it something you'd always wanted to do? Well, actually, it was the brainchild of an Australian filmmaker who had um, had the idea to simply do a show about urban legends, but uh, they had found that doing that in the past, they were sort of dry, so they wanted to uh, actually try to replicate these things. And often the replication of stuff is, it can be also kind of uh, either, I, you know, sometimes it's not that effective, but when they, apparently when they uh, saw us and we, we did a little demo tape when we were approached about it. Uh, the, the, the kind of, I guess, enthusiasm that we have for our work and the creativity that we apply towards it resonated. And so they, they, the, the show became ours as a result of that. Well, uh, so we were hired talent at the beginning, but over the years that, well, I mean, and like all of our other skills that we're marginal, marginally talented at, <laughs> um, we learned it on the job. And somewhere around three or four years in, we really made the show something that was ours that we really felt a sense of ownership over. And that, that makes it feel really pleasurable. You know, it, it is, it is it's like we've got to go to work and communicate something about what it's like to try this or do this or experiment with this or learn this. Uh, and it's an unbelievable framework. It, it is an astonishing thing. It is like we feel so lucky every day at the mental exercise like the working out our brains get in doing this show you know it's funny when uh, when I got approached to do this I call Adam up and uh, uh, and you know I'm like so I got approached by this this guy about you know maybe doing a TV show you want to come down and you know let's give it you know maybe we could do it together because I didn't think I could you know host the thing by myself and uh, so he came down with, uh, we, we had a video camera and he came down and we got an intern to film it. And basically we ran around in, in the shop and set a few things on fire and ran away and, you know. <laughs> the, our uh, demo reel is functionally indistinguishable from Mythbusters. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, so it seemed, it seemed to work. It, and uh, that's, that's still what we're doing 10 years yeah. later. It's weird. Thanks for your question. Uh, Adam and Jamie, there's nothing I can say that isn't a cliche, but thank you guys so much for inspiring people to bring items into our lives that used to just be in people's imaginations. Uh, wow. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, thank you. And the, the second thing is, to kind of, one day I hope to see you guys in Hall H, do you guys plan on doing any more collaborations with bigger television shows? Because I, I absolutely love that Breaking Bad preview. Uh, uh, absolutely. absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Any, if we any can. specific? Yeah, that, uh, the Breaking Bad episode, uh, the, the actual, you know, sometimes when you do things uh, uh, like, say, uh, we, we like to say when we're approaching a story, we want to do the story because what we're actually doing is interesting. If you come in and try to fill a category, like, say, Breaking Bad, you know, go do, do some crap with ba Breaking Bad, that doesn't necessarily make a good story. But in this case, luckily, it, it was it was great. The, well, I mean, those guys. Vince is such a science geek. It was just fantastic to work with them. Uh, and uh, the the how do I put this? Uh, it's it's like the, the story comes in, and if we're interested, it's the reason we haven't done Shark Week in a couple of years because we really every time we go over the list, we feel like we've done all the shark stuff we're we're interested in doing. Uh, uh, and, what about the Shark NATO? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we'll get right on that. <laughs> I've been seeing the tweets. Clearly, we need to address it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank Thanks. you. I'm a meteorologist. I don't think you should do Sharknado. Just 
Hi, I'm Debbie, and uh, I'm wondering if either or both of you could talk about a story from your childhood, maybe where you first thought, hey, I wonder how that works. I think I'll blow it up. What a fantastic question. Um, I, I have something that didn't involve explosives, but it's, it's, it's close in a strange way. Uh, I grew up on a farm, and we, we lived out in an area that, uh, in Indiana that had, um, it, was a, it was an old estate, and um, it had a rather large yard. It was a nice place. Um, and my job as a teenager was to mow the lawn, but the lawn was about 10 acres. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I had this, we had this, um, this mower that was, it was sort of a ride-along mower, but, uh, but it was relatively small, and it took like all weekend to, to mow this lawn. And so I found out early on that I, I devised a whole series of ways uh, over time that I could uh, destroy the lawnmower. And, <laughs> and you know, so, uh, the, this particular lawnmower was able to go in reverse and forward instantaneously. And among other things, I noticed that if I went up to a tree and went into it reverse and forward repeatedly, that something eventually would happen that would make the mower not work anymore. <laughs> um, and that would involve my father coming in with the welder or whatever it is, and I was off the hook until the thing was repaired. Um, I even found that I, I could do things like pull the spark plug, plug wire back inside the, the uh, little cup that's on the end of it so that it didn't actually make a connection, but to look at it, you wouldn't, wouldn't know. And, uh, and he's, uh, he's learning a valuable skill at the same time. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, you know, it's not unlike what we do now in a strange way. I, I, I remember being a young model maker in San Francisco in the early 90s, and uh, Jamie was my boss, and he sent me to uh, California Ice Company or something like that to get dry ice. I had never bought dry ice before, so I just walked up to the counter and said, can I get some dry ice? And he goes, yeah. And I look, and there's a sign there, and it says, you must be 18 to buy dry ice. I'm like, as far as I know, you can't get high from dry ice. So what's up with that? And I say, hey, why do you have to be 18 to buy dry ice? And the guy behind the counter goes just like this. Oh, because if you take a little bit of it and you put it in a two-liter soda bottle and add water and cap it, it'll blow up, makes a huge explosion. I was like, do they really want this guy behind the counter? But of course, and Jamie was actually out of town at that point. So we got back with all this dry ice, and first thing we did, two liter soda bottle. Well, maybe let's scrunch it so that we have a little more time. You know, put some dry ice in it, put the water in, scrunch it up. Just got it out the door, boom! I mean, it's, you lose your hand, it's terrifying. So then we thought, and this is very myth -bustery, we thought, well, maybe it'll be safer if we use a smaller bottle. Science! <laughs> So, so we used a little bottle, uh, like a 12-ounce bottle of Evian, and we put the dry ice in there, we put some water in, and we capped it, and we threw it out the door, and it hit the street, rolled all the way across the street. It's a production, film production studio across the street that was like our prime source of livelihood. And the bottle just sat there, and of course, this is something we've learned on Mythbusters, what if nothing happens? So we're like, oh, crap. <laughs> then after like five minutes, we had a smoke. We're like, that's eh, probably not going to go off. <laughs> Ten minutes later, it went off, and it was the most ear shatter. It, we could hear car alarms from a block away <laughs> that were set off by this thing. Do not try that at home. <laughs> I, I do want to add that I, I, now that I think about it, I do recall that, uh, that firecrackers and marshmallows puts really sticky things in your sister's hair. <laughs> Too many jokes! Uh, do not try that at <laughs> home. I've just been handed a note. Uh, there is a uh, exciting video coming. Uh, when we are done, which will be very shortly, so I want to let you all know that maybe when we say thank you, you don't run away. 
So there, now you know, only four of you will be blown up and it's already been placed under your seat so you're not gonna get away anyhow. Let's go to our very next question. Hi, my name's Sharon and one of the great things about Mythbusters is that you show that it's okay to be wrong. What's, the, what's your favorite incidence of being wrong? Oh, God. I'm wrong so often. It's great. I'll tell you, my, one of my favorite episodes about that was swimming in syrup. The myth is that you can swim just as fast in syrup and water because what you lose in forward momentum, you gain in material that you can push against. And not only did we find this was in fact true, but it's actually so hard to define viscosity because like most scientific things, it is not an absolute value. It is a relationship between molecules and their environment and their temperature and their speed and everything. And this is a story in which we were spending tens of thousands of dollars making giant pools of syrup. So we had to be very careful about how we shot this. We couldn't go back and make a new kind of syrup if we got it wrong. And we were so wrong about the results of every test every day that we had to rewrite the next day's set of experiments every day. And consequently, it's one of my favorite episodes in terms of the science because it's so like, vital and cool what we ended up coming up with. Were you, uh, were you involved in that whole big syrup heist out of Quebec a couple no. of years ago? <laughs> no, but if there's another molasses flood like in Boston back in the 19th century, <laughs> we'd know how to survive it. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your question. Next question. Next. How's it going, guys? All right. Um, I have a science teacher who, for an assignment, had all of us watch your moon landing episode. And still, after we watched it, many of the students were still skeptical. Which episode? The moon landing episode? Moon landing. Anyway, <laughs> I was wondering if you guys would possibly do another one. Absolutely. Yes. Of course, we would uh, prefer to do that by actually making our own rocket ship yes. and going to the moon. Yes. Um, You're also, this is one case in which we will not be surprised by the result we come to. And you're going to have to accept some bias on our part because we know that we're right. Uh, this will be our last question, so please come up with the last question. Love the question. Last Crusade episode, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, Cindy. So I, I win. <laughs> Uh, my name is William, and uh, I'm an astronomy major, and this is going to be my last Comic-Con because of that. And when I was growing up, I had Bill Nye the Science Guy, the History Channel that actually showed history, uh, Star Trek The Next Generation, and things that just kind of made me love science and love learning and love discovery. And now, really, all that's left is you guys and, like, you know, the real housewives of some pawn shop in New Jersey. <laughs> so, <laughs> unfortunately, my little cousins, like, they're five and three, and they're not going to have, you know, what I had growing up. So... Uh, how do you guys feel about, you know, being kind of an island of, in of intellect and, you know, an ocean of ignorance? I mean, wh wh where do you guys stand on that? What do you think can be done about that? That is a great question. We, we should... I feel like the answer would take a couple of beers and I would rant a lot in the middle of it. I'm looking forward to you. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> I'll be your huckleberry. Well, you know, uh, it's interesting that it's, that's what happens with these uh, the shows that are driven by ratings. You know, um, it's, we're, we're tethered to them as well. And, you know, those, those shows are apparently getting good ratings and that's, they're, they're paying the advertisers. Uh, it, it's something that we, uh, we don't really know what to do about. You know, we're, we're gonna try to c produce new content. We've been actually working on a lot of shows or on developing shows on our own. And uh, with Tested.com, you know, that, that is, we're also putting our energy there. We, look, we, we take seriously the idea that our job is not necessarily science education, but communication. And that, is something that we don't necessarily have to do on television if it turns out that Mythbusters is no longer viable. Um, don't get me wrong, like I said, we'll keep doing it until they lock the doors, but Tested.com is absolutely part of, that, of, part of that grand plan to keep on doing that and keep on pushing that content out. Yeah, you know, when we started doing this, we didn't intend, we had no kind of higher motive. We're just trying to make a living and it seemed like it would be fun. It's, it's great if you can earn a living doing something that's fun. So that's what we did. Now, over time, we realized, yes, this thing seems to be actually 
doing stuff like encouraging people to be interested in science and it, there's thoughtful content that pops up. And, and that's great, let's do as much as we can. I, I don't know how, but if we can find a way we're going to continue to do that in, in newer, better, greater ways. Exactly. Thank you for your question. We also, I just, I think we're going to throw to the clip in just a minute, but I wanted to say we couldn't do it without you guys. I mean, you guys are the early adopters. You are the proselytizers. You are the, your enthusiasm keeps us interested in this, and thank you. We guys, we love coming here. We love Comic-Con. We love this crowd. We want to thank you. Wow. Thank you. Adam Savage and Janie Heineman, you guys. Hey, guys, it's Norm from Tested.com. I'm here with... Adam Savage. Hi, I'm Will. I'm Jamie. It's Adam from Tested. I'm Adam from Tested. Hey guys, we're here at Jamie's office at M5. And we are back in the cave. The cave. Thanks for uh, joining me in the talking room. Oh, happy to be here. Sitting directly to our right is uh, Jamie, Jamie Heineman. Hi. Hi. Hey guys, I hear you have a question about life here uh, on the International Space Station. Adam, we're in your kitchen today. This, this is my house kitchen. This is the gun called the ZF-1. The Zorg industry. It's gluing metal together yeah. and welding, right? Yes. Uh, I'd say it's a little bit advanced for someone just getting started with modeling. Can I go right off the clip? Uh, you can't go off the clip. Oh, well, uh, darn. Um, <laughs> I try to use a lot of butter, but that even that is like, I'm like, I feel guilty just looking at it. Theory, it ought to work, and it ought to only work in space. And all you do is go <laughs> pull the trigger and your your welding. See, I can see, I can hear, I can even walk up and purchase things. We'll have more from the shelves in the cave and the future edition of Inside the Cave. Absolutely. Red bag on the ground!